Good morning, everyone. It's, it's very nice to be here with you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us this morning. So you guys have a, a series of seminars in quantum, quantum condensed matter. And today we have the honor to have Philip, who, who is here, our guinea pig today for this, this series of seminars. Philip is a, a, he just got his PhD from Boston University. He has done amazing cooperation in quantum commerce and matter. And now he just joined our group at Northeastern University uh, and Fagan's group. Uh, uh, one of the things, I think one of the main contributions Philip has done to us was this amazing package, Quantum Spin, <laughs> which is a package for the exact diagonalization algorithms, also Quantum Monte Carlo. And today he's going to talk about Pocket Adiabatic Theorem with this. So, yes. Uh, thank you, Christia. Yeah, it's a uh, it's uh, very nice to be here with everybody. Um, yeah, so I actually started in March, but because of the pandemic and everything, um, I haven't been able to meet a lot of people in the physics department. So uh, thank you all for coming and joining us for this seminar. Um, so this is actually some of the first work that I did during my PhD when I was kind of exploring, um, you know, various projects with different uh, advisors and um, so on. So. I started out with uh, Floquet theory because it was pretty hot topic back uh, back when I first started. Um, so this work was done with a lot of people throughout um, BU, uh, but yeah, since then everyone's kind of moved on. So I put everybody's current affiliations here, and you can find the publication uh, at Physics Reports in this um, um, article down here. So it's a very long article, but we're going to touch on kind of the most important parts. Um, and my talk will be outlined as follows. So first I'm going to briefly discuss what are periodically driven systems, why are they interesting, and uh, Floquet, what is Floquet's theorem uh, applied to quantum systems. Uh, and from there I'll talk about adiabatic perturbation theory, uh, both you know, in a general sense and specifically for Floquet systems. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about three different applications of uh, Floquet adiabatic perturbation theory to three different models with increasing complexity. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the harmonic oscillator, uh, an exactly solvable model, which makes it a very nice case to start out with. Um, then we're going to uh, add some nonlinearity to the problem and look at the quantum Capizza pendulum. And uh, we're going to discuss the ramifications of the uh, nonlinearity uh, and its um, effect on Floquet adiabatic perturbation theory. And then finally, we're going to end with a many body problem, which is the non integrable transverse realizing model. Uh, and I'll talk about, uh, I'll give a detailed description of what that is when we get there. And then finally, we'll discuss the conclusions and um, also kind of other things that are not discussed in this talk, but also in the paper that are in the paper. Okay, so recently, uh, and also probably, you know, back in the past, periodically driven systems have been used to develop effective Hamiltonians. Uh, Hamiltonians that you wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, design directly in an experiment. Um, so for example, uh, you can drive the system periodically and you can uh, dynamically change, let's say the hopping in a cold, uh, a cold gas, uh, either fermions or bosons, and drive the system from a superfluid to a Mott insulating transition. Or in some cases, you can even get non-trivial topological phenomena by doing this periodic driving. Um, so this is very interesting for experimentalists because they get to design these fancy experiments with Hamiltonians that are different than what you'd normally be able to uh, do in a lab setting. Um, and, you know, I, it, I only really talk about cold atom systems, but there's also application beyond that. Um, so this is important. Uh, so what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to study a periodically driven system. In this case, the Hamiltonian uh, is periodic in time, but we're also going to introduce another parameter called lambda. Um, but ignoring lambda for the time being, uh, if our Hamiltonian is periodic in time, uh, 
uh, there's a theorem which says that the evolution operator can be written as a product of two unitary operators. The first one, this P operator kind of represents the motion within a period of time T. And then this second part is described by a, what is called the Floquet Hamiltonian. Um, and this P operator is defined such that at integer multiples of the period, it's the identity. Um, and there's many different ways of actually casting this, but I'm going to be uh, keeping with this particular definition of the Floquet Hamiltonian. Um, so graphically, you can think about the P operator kind of modulating any oscillations within a period, and then there's kind of an envelope which is governing the long time dynamics, which is typically described by this Floquet Hamiltonian. Um, but one thing to note is that a, a, this motion within a period doesn't necessarily have to be small. Uh, I think in some cases it turns out to be small because of the, uh, the fact that you're uh, driving the system very fast. But in other cases, it can actually be the dominant feature in the dynamics of our system. Um, so what we want to do is we want to promote lambda to now a slowly dependent uh, time varying function. So our system is no longer periodic, but it's almost periodic. So if we go super duper slow, uh, the mismatch in the amplitude of the drive, let's say, or the mismatch in our Hamiltonian from one period to the next is so small that it actually makes sense to use our Floquet states, or in other words, the eigenvalues of this Floquet Hamiltonian as a basis to expand our wave function in. Um, so this is reminiscent of the standard adiabatic theorem. Uh, so in that case, what we have is we have a Hamiltonian which depends on a parameter. Uh, and let's say, for example, we start in the ground states at some initial time. And what adiabatic perturbation theory says is that I can model or I can understand the transition rates between instantaneous eigenstates of H and calculate uh, the transition rates perturbatively in the velocity of our protocol. Um, and if you go through the uh, and work in this uh, instantaneous eigenbase of H of lambda, you can derive the expression to leading order and perturbation theory, which is proportional to lambda dot, which is the velocity at the given time in the protocol. Um, there's also this time dependent phase, which is given by the energy differences between the different eigenenergies. Now, the most natural way of generalizing this expression would be to replace, instead of the uh, transition rates between the instantaneous eigenstates of our Hamiltonian, we would look at the instantaneous eigenstates of our Floquet Hamiltonian. Uh, in that case, effectively, what you're doing is you're ignoring this fast motion. Um, uh, it, it, this has kind of been studied in the past. It, it, you basically can derive this expression here from doing a time averaged uh, a time average over the period, uh, basically this uh, fast time t. Um, so one thing that we wanted to look at is uh, the importance of this fast motion in uh, this adiabatic expansion. Because uh, what we found is that this expression is exact only when you take the, frequ uh, the frequency to infinity. Um, so one question that we had was, okay, what happens when the frequency is finite, uh, but still you know, much larger than the scales of, uh, let's say, the velocity of our uh, protocol? So what we did was we did the calculation ourselves, and um, this has also been done in the literature as well, uh, but we find that the most generic expression you can come to not only includes a contribution from the Floquet Hamiltonian, but also includes a contribution from the P operator. And in particular, there's a derivative, basically this uh, derivative of P and P dagger. It, it basically represents the modulation of the amplitude of the, dri of the drive within uh, a period. So for example, here you can see that there's kind of a mismatch between the amplitude of the drive between two different periods of the motion. Uh, and that gets smaller as the uh, drive, let's say, duration gets very long. 
Um, but this picture is a bit misleading. You think, okay, well, if I have a very, very, very long uh, protocol where the amplitude is barely changing as a function of time, I really shouldn't have to worry about the P operator. But this is uh, misleading because you're actually missing the mismatch that happens when you're, let's say, you're um, stopping at some point within a period. And this can be important when your P operator is the dominant contribution to this. Uh, so just demonstrate this. We're going to first talk about, oh, sorry. Um, Right, so just so everyone knows, we're going to define lambda to be some function which is monotonically increasing between zero and one over the ramp time, which we call TF. And TF is just one over V. Uh, so whatever you see V, that's the inverse of the, basically the ramp time of our protocol. Okay, so in many cases, lambda, the form of lambda T is not important. It just has to be slowly changing. Okay, so first application we're going to look at is the harmonic oscillator. And our harmonic oscillator, we have our undriven term, and then we're going to force it uh, using a linear, um, or basically just a, a, this, just a forced harmonic oscillator. Um, so this is nice because we can actually derive an exact solution for the problem and we can get a sense of what, like what is adiabatic perturbation theory actually telling us. Uh, so first, we need to calculate these CNs, right? Both exactly and in perturbation theory. And to do so first, we have to calculate our Floquet Hamiltonian and our P operator, and then calculate our Floquet eigenstates at a fixed value of lambda. Um, and this is very, again, we can solve this for any function of lambda, so this would be very easy to do. And then next, we want to take lambda and make it a time-dependent function, in this case, just a linear ramp, um, and calculate the exact evolution, starting from the ground states of our Hamiltonian at t equals zero and lambda equals zero. Um, so in this case, once we have the exact wave function, we can just project onto our Floquet eigenstates and then get our uh, exact expressions for the amplitudes as a function of time. Um, and specifically, we're gonna be looking at the excitations above the Floquet ground states. In this case, um, it becomes a little more subtle later on as to what the Floquet ground state actually is. But in this case, because we have an exact solution, we can uh, label our eigenstates of our Floquet Hamiltonian in some ascending order, which allows us to find the ground states. Okay, so, and just to give you a sense of what this kind of looks like, um, so here's an example of the expectation value of the position of our wave packet as a function of time uh, during the ramp and then after the ramp. And you can see here the blue is the exact solution and the uh, orange is the Floquet ground states. And you can see that it tracks pretty well with the, uh, flow, the exact solution tracks very well with the Floquet ground states. Um, so intuitively, this makes sense to, it makes sense to actually use the Floquet Hamiltonian as kind of a basis to expand our wave function in. Um, so the exact result we find is that uh, we can express everything as one minus e to the v squared times delta of t. And delta of t is just a bounded oscillatory function. Um, the exact form is not very important, but the important part is it's bounded. And you can see that as the velocity goes to zero, this excitation probability goes to zero. And it actually goes to zero as the velocity squared. And that makes sense because our um, uh, our amplitude is linear in lambda dot, or in this case, our velocity. And so our you know, excitations will go as V squared to leading order. Okay, so now we wanna actually compare the different types of perturbation theory. Um, so again, we're going to, here's the exact solution, and we're going to overlay the different types of uh, solutions here. So first, what happens when we use the infinite frequency version, right? The frequent, the version where I've averaged over the fast motion. 
And the interesting part of this is um, I've actually chosen the phase of the drive, uh, basically the, the shift in the drive, such that this correction uh, from the uh, infinite frequency adiabatic perturbation theory is actually exactly zero. Um, and so this is, you know, a direct demonstration of how if you just use the infinite, the Floquet Hamiltonian, you're actually missing uh, the, you're missing the, um, a major contribution for some values of the phase of the drive. But if we include the, the uh, contribution from the P operator, we find that the uh, excitation probability exactly matches leading order uh, the expansion of our exact results. So in this case, it's V squared times this, again, delta of T, which is the oscillatory function that I talked about earlier. So for this particular value of the phase, this contribution uh, is ex the only thing that it matters for the excitations, and it exactly replicates the exact solution to leading order. Okay. So to summarize, this P of T basically gives us the mismatch between different values of lambda in the adiabatic expansion. Um, and it's important because the contribution from the Floquet Hamiltonian can be zero for certain, uh, in certain cases. Um, but in more recent work, uh, and also a bit in the original uh, paper, uh, it's actually been shown that this fast motion contains important topological phenomena in Floquet systems. So normally you'd think that, okay, the Floquet Hamiltonian will have some non-trivial topological phenomena, but it turns out that you can actually get non-trivial topological phenomena from this uh, P operator. Okay, so in the next example, we're going to make it a little more complicated uh, and we're going to look at what is called the Kapitza pendulum. Um, so the driving is a little bit different. So instead of driving a linear force, which would correspond to a sine of theta in this case, we're actually gonna drive the, uh, effectively the, we're gonna drive the x squared term, if you're thinking about it in terms of the harmonic oscillator. So uh, this omega here is actually going to be important because if you include this omega in the amplitude of the drive, you can show that in the infinite frequency limits, uh, your Kapitza pendulum actually develops a stable minimum at theta equals pi. So this is kind of the typical example of uh, why the Kapitza pendulum is interesting for periodically driven systems. Um, but in this case, we're, since we're starting out in the limit of lambda equals zero, we're real, what we're really going to be doing is we're going to be modulating the effective um, spring constant of our pendulum, right? The, the effective uh, curvature of the minimum of the potential. So when I take my lambda from zero to one, uh, basically, we expect that our wave packet is just going to get compressed, right? Uh, nothing too crazy. So before I talked about how we have what is, we have a Floquet ground state. Um, but it turns out that in a generic system, um, this is actually not very easy to define. And the reason for this is that your Floquet Hamiltonian is actually defined with a folded spectrum. So much like in a periodic uh, uh, lattice system, you have a Brillouin zone where basically your, uh, your um, uh, dispersion relation gets folded in between minus pi over two and pi over two, the, uh, the momentum windows. The energies of our evolution operator get folded into a window between zero and uh, omega, which is the frequency. Um, so here's kind of an example of what that would look like numerically. So you'd have all these levels kind of crossing um, through the boundary here and then coming out the bottom. And this is specifically because I define my Floquet Hamiltonian as the uh, log of a unitary operator. Uh, in this case. So this is important because we can't really, in general, we can't really define a ground state, right? Because I can't use the quasi-energies because the quasi-energies uh, are not 
related to any sort of physical property. They're kind of just related to the differences in energies and states that get coupled together um, via uh, photons. So we have to use some other means to characterize a what is a physically looks like a ground state. Um, so in this case, for the Kapitza pendulum, what we found is that a good metric of that is the fluctuations in momentum space. So we can express our wave function and ex do a Fourier transform and find how spread out our wave function is in a momentum space. And generally speaking, we found that um, states that had lower physical energy, and not quasi energy, but physical energy had a lower momentum spread. And this kind of intuitively makes sense. So like for the high energy states, I'm going to have basically the, the rotor or the pendulum, if you wish, is gonna be uh, rotating around and around very fast. Um, so that's uh, what we use here. But another way of characterizing the adiabaticity of our system is the, what is called the diagonal entropy. And in this case, we just look at the spread of the wave function in Floquet space. So what that means is that if my system is occupying one state, then this entropy value is gonna be very small. Um, in the context of many body systems, actually one thing that has been used is uh, entanglement. So you know that a, a ground state should have area law entanglement, and that has been used in some cases to characterize what is our Floquet ground state. Okay, so let's look at the results for the Kapitza pendulum. And um, from Floquet adiabatic perturbation theory, we can uh, show that both the diagonal entropy and this fidelity, which is uh, the overlap with the Floquet ground state, both go as velocity squared to leading order. Um, and specifically, we're going to pick final ramp times, which are integer multiples of the period. And this is to basically avoid a lot of those oscillations that we saw in the harmonic oscillator example. Um, so we don't really care about those oscillations. Uh, we just want to look at what happens as a function of velocity. Okay, so focusing on panel A, we have the, law, the fidelity versus velocity on a log-log scale. Um, and so some notable things to look at is that our flow K adiabatic perturbation theory seems to work very well in this range of intermediate velocities, but it seems to break down in both the very low velocity regime and the very high velocity regime. And this high velocity regime is kind of understandable, right? Because your velocity is very large and so it no longer is a good parameter to expand your um, uh, per perturbative expansion in. Um, but when the velocity gets small, something weird is happening. And in fact, when we first did this simulation, we actually thought that there was a bug in our code because we're trying to figure out why our um, why this was deviating at low velocities. But it turns out that this actually has, uh, it is definitely something that is physical and is um, uh, gonna be the subject of the rest of this talk effectively. Um, in the panel B, we show a comparison between the numerical results for the fidelity uh, Floquet perturbation theory and then the, again, the averaged uh, one which only works at omega equals infinity and you can see again another example of where the uh, p operator is important to capture at least some small part of the uh, fidelity here and then finally another thing that we are going to use to characterize the validity of our flow k adiabatic perturbation theory is um, looking at the energy of the undriven hamiltonian and the reason for doing this is that um, uh, you can get a sense of whether or not the system is reached a particular state by the fact that it reaches a plateau value. So what this means is that the amplitudes have stabilized in, my, in our um, flow K basis, let's say. Uh, but at high frequencies, the energy hasn't converged yet. And at low frequencies, we see that the energy actually increases. So this is important in our understanding of what the failure of FAPT means uh, in this low velocity regime. Um, and finally, 
we can look at this flow K diagonal entropy, which is going to be basically a proxy for this uh, uh, log fidelity from now on, because it's, this is much easier to define and also uh, calculate. Um, so what we see is that the, again, there is a window where the velocities at intermediate velocities where um, FAPT kind of, or the system follows flow K adiabatic perturbation theory, but then at low velocities, the system just uh, goes crazy and it begins to absorb energy uh, as described by this plot here. Um, and in particular, we plotted it versus um, one, it's hard to see, unfortunately, but we basically came up with a quantity which mimics the uh, log, uh, sorry, the um, diagonal entropy, but the transition, we include a transition rate, which is given by the landau zener transition. Um, and we see that it actually does a pretty good job of at least kind of matching qualitatively what's happening in this low velocity regime. So this seems to indicate that this low velocity regime is kind of like a landau zener transition. So this kind of leads naturally into the next part of the talk. So we need to revisit the question of what does adiabatic mean in this context? So before we talk about flow case systems, let's just focus on the standard adiabatic, uh, standard adiabatic theorem. Um, and when we talk about the standard adiabatic theorem, we have our energy levels as a function of lambda. They're you know, undergoing some sort of dynamics in this lambda space. And what the adiabatic theorem says is that when we reach one of these avoided crossings, which inevitably happen in the spectrum, uh, in order to be adiabatic, we must go uh, very, very slow through this avoided crossing, right? So that we stay in our uh, energy level. Uh, and so that's the standard notion of adiabaticity. But in the case of flow case systems, it's a little more complicated because we don't have an unbounded spectrum. We actually get uh, uh, these levels, these quasi energy levels, which actually cross uh, a lot, right? You see, because of the folding, because our spectrum is folded within um, uh, our, that bound between zero and omega, we find that these levels are crossing like crazy. Uh, so some of these states actually might have physical energy, which is much larger than our initial states. And so, um, why this is important is that while these crossing points might look, you know, on one scale, they might look like they're just a normal crossing, not an avoided crossing. It turns out that if you actually zoom in very, very close, there's an exponentially small gap between these two states. Uh, and so what we've really been talking about in terms of the um, adiabatic is actually not the standard notion of adiabaticity, but really it means avoiding these resonances or these very, very small, exponentially small avoided crossings. Uh, and so we did this with the Kapitza pendulum where we basically found that this avoided crossing here or this, yeah, very small avoided crossing here was uh, connecting basically a very high energy state with this kind of effectively low energy state. And so the breakdown of FAPT actually corresponds to when I cross this avoided crossing adiabatically in the standard sense. Um, and physically what this means is that I'm going from a low, a state with low physical energy to a state with high physical energy. And in essence, what it means is I'm absorbing energy from my drive. Um, so that was a very interesting phenomena that we found. Um, so the next question is, uh, what happens when I have a many body system, right? So in this case, um, there's only a small number of these crossings that actually happen, right? Because it's a single particle system, the density of states uh, doesn't increase exponentially with the physical energy. It really, the number of states that are, uh, you know, um, connected to this ground state via one photon or two photons is not going to be very different. Um, 
But the problem is when I have a many body system, the number of states that I can connect to in energy is actually going to be exponentially large. So the question is, can this, uh, does this flow K adiabatic theory actually hold when I have a many body system, right? Because you have a competition between two exponentials. You have this exponentially small gap between um, my flow K ground state and excited states. But then you also have, um, uh, you also have an exponentially number of these states that you're crossing with. So the question is, which exponential wins? Um, so to demonstrate this, we pick kind of the simplest model to study, um, I guess, uh, in many body systems. In this case, it's a transverse field Ising model. And in order to make it so that it's interacting, because um, as some of you may know, this model without this parallel field is actually exactly solvable. Uh, so it actually doesn't have the properties that we would like. Uh, but if we introduce this parallel field, we actually uh, make it so that the, the problem is not exactly solvable. And it's known to people who study quantum ergodicity that you know, if you make a strong enough parallel field, this model is actually very, very non-integrable. Um, it's very, very, uh, I guess, oh, yeah. It, it, it's a very good model to study this with, basically. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to drive the uh, transverse fields periodically, again, scaling the frequency with omega. Um, to make it so that it has a well-defined, um, uh, well, okay, it's not, it's not that important, but basically we're gonna drive the system very strongly uh, with the frequency scaling the amplitude of the drive. Um, this model has been studied before when you do not have this parallel field, uh, again, because it has a nice exact solution to it, um, and it's been shown that this system actually exhibits uh, a phase transition, a quantum phase transition, when you drive, when you change this amplitude lambda or this this uh, combination of a f. And I have an example of what the quasi particle spectrum of this model looks like um, when uh, you change this amplitude. And you can see by tuning the amplitude, you can actually go through, uh, you can close the gap in this quasi particle spectrum, which is our critical points. Um, uh, so the, the reason why I mentioned this is that we want to drive our system uh, at frequencies high enough to not excite these quasi particles because uh, we want to study the many body effects. We don't want to study this, these quasi particle excitations um, because this has already been well studied and also it's not the important aspect of what we'd like to understand. So. Uh, in order to avoid these quasi-particle excitations, we have to drive with frequencies which are larger than, sorry, larger than twice the bandwidth. Um, uh, there's a reason why this is the case. It's because you have to excite two quasi-particles at once. You can't just excite one. Um, and then your uh, frequency must be less than the many-body bandwidth because if I drive above the many-body bandwidth, um, I'm not folding the spectrum at all. Uh, so think about this diagram, right? If all my eigenstates are, can fit within the omega window, then I never actually have any resonances. And so I'll never actually see any uh, breakdown of flow K, this flow K perturbation theory because there's never any coupling between them. Um, okay. So we actually, this, is, th this project was one of the first uh, the, one of the first, or not even the first, the, the uh, development of QSPIN was actually based off of this project. So um, back in the day, we were able to do up to L equals 18 uh, for a periodic chain, um, which was, I think actually is still pretty big because of the times that you have to evolve to is very large. Um, but here, so for L equals 18, we basically have two variables to play around with, right? We have our, we're going to fix our J and our HX, but modify HZ and our omega. Um, and of course, I'm going to define this quantity uh, 
E, which is again just the energy, the expectation value of the uh, undriven Hamiltonian. Okay, so focusing on going from left to right, there I know there's a lot of plots here, so I'll walk you through. There's uh, going from left to right, we have omega increasing, so the the frequency of the drive is getting larger, um, and then within these plots, I have different values of h. Uh, Z. So in this case, HZ equals zero is blue, HZ, HZ equals 0 0.1 is red, and HZ equals 0 0.4 is yellow, and HZ equals 0 0.9 is uh, purple. So at the lowest driving frequency, we find that when HZ is equal to zero, the blue line, our uh, curves exactly follow what is expected for adiabatic perturbation theory. And all, all this is saying is that when I turn off the HZ term, I basically am driving above the, I, I'd never couple any of these quasi particles together uh, because the system is non interacting. And so the only way I can get non trivial, oh, okay. The only way I can get non-trivial excitations is if I drive below the quasi-particle frequency, but I'm explicitly avoiding that. So that's why here it follows adiabatic perturbation theory. But then as I increase omega, you can see that there's a regime that grows where even the value, uh, even having a finite value of HZ still gives you some window where your adiabatic perturbation theory can actually apply or work. Um, and that's kind of the uh, crux of this whole calculation here. So you see that if your frequencies are large, but not larger than the many body bandwidth, you can still get uh, a regime of velocities where your um, adiabatic perturbation theory will actually be valid. Um, so this is actually very interesting. Uh, but one subtlety here you might think is, um, uh, what happens in the thermodynamic limit, right? I'm at L equals 18, and I have symmetries, which reduces the number of states in the Hilbert space. Uh, so how can I trust that this will still happen in the thermodynamic limit? And so in order to address that, we tried to do finite size scaling to the best that we can, um, given the methods that we have available to us. But as far as we could tell, uh, when you change the system size, this window didn't seem to move at all, right? So if you look at this, um, for our largest omega, which is the one which should be stable, you see that this window actually doesn't change very much at all with different system sizes. And of course, going from 10 to 18, isn't there's still an exponentially, there's still a large number of states that are being included between these. So, um, we argue that basically because of, uh, because of how little this changes, we'd expect that this should continue into the thermodynamic limit. So what this means is that the competition is being won out by the exponential suppression of the, these resonances. They're too small, even though that there's an exponentially large number of them. Okay, so going through the conclusions, um, so it's important to, uh, include adiabatic corrections from both the Floquet Hamiltonian and the fast motion operator peak. Uh, however, adiabatic perturbation theory doesn't take into account uh, resonant coupling between states with different physical energies. And this causes a failure uh, when the velocity goes to zero because our system absorbs energy from the drive. Um, however, what we did find is that these Resonances are suppressed exponentially as the frequency goes to infinity, uh, even if there is a large density of states in a many body system. So this just means that there's, this still is useful for a many body system to describe the dynamics. Uh, so finally, just to advertise some things that are not discussed in this talk, but also are discussed in the paper. Um, in the paper, we actually do an explicit derivation of what we call the Floquet-Berry curvature. Uh, and we talk about an application of it to uh, a quantized thallus energy pump, which is basically we take a two-level system and we show that you can pump 
exactly one quanta of energy uh, using this periodically driven uh, or this flow K adiabatic perturbation theory framework. Um, and this has been used to in other contexts and I think now even in many body systems to kind of describe um, flow K topological properties. And then finally, um, there's an analysis of the breakdown of flow K perturbation theory, but we attack it from the perspective of the high frequency expansion. And that's very, that actually is interesting because it discusses uh, some more technical issues related to this flow K high frequency expansion, which is kind of the basis of a lot of these, this work on flow K engineering uh, of uh, uh, experimental systems. And that's uh, my seminar. So thank you very much for coming and I will take questions now. Thank you, Phil. I will unmute all the participants so you can ask questions. Let me just... Anyone who have a question, please raise your hand. Questions? Uh, Martin has a question. Okay. Let me just see how can you can unmute yourself, Martin. Yes, hello. Yes, oh, we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Yeah, just I had a question um, at uh, sure. the beginning of the talk in your, in your first example, the very first. Uh, I think you were comparing uh, different approximations. Yes. Uh, uh, let's see. This slide? Uh, yes. Yeah. So what was the frequency that you used in this example compared to the um, uh, relevant uh, scale? Oh, oh okay. the frequency here okay. is five. Yeah, yeah sorry. We just said. So mm -hmm. relatively small. But I think in this case, the most important part is really the phase. Uh, so in the expressions, it turns out that you can really change the properties of the coefficients by tuning this phase of the drive. So really switching from between a sine and cosine kind of makes a difference. Um, um, do you understand why? So there's, yeah, it's, it's been a while since I've actually looked at this, but it's related to um, partially it's related to where you stop during the period of the drive. So it, it basically think about it like you can um, modify the phase, but you can also absorb that into the kind of the stopping point within a period, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly one to one, but roughly speaking, it means that um, at that point in the drive, there's, basically a con uh, what conspires is that this term cancels exactly with the, the um, time average part of this. Mm. And so it, these two terms kind of conspire together to cancel out exactly uh, at this frequency. And it's just due to the fact that you are in between the, either going through the, the I forget if it's you're going through the, um, the equilibrium position or, uh, whether or not you're at the end. I, I don't remember which one it is, but it's one of those specific points where you're kind Yeah, of, so uh, is, is this um, something specific for this example or uh, could you draw more general um, statements? Yeah, so in, I think we didn't see an, an example of this, but we did show in the Kapitza pendulum that, um, so part of it might have something to do with the fact that we're using a linear force as opposed to driving the actual potential, but you can see even in the case of the Kapitza pendulum, and I, it's, sorry, it's very hard to see, I can zoom in, but you can see that the, there is a difference between the two, um, and the, the contribution from the P operator actually can basically make a difference between this being off by, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, but you can see it matches very well when you include the P operator, and this is kind of a more generic example of where this happens. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Any other question? Uh, I, I've got a question. So um, now I realize that for um, large velocity also, uh, of course, it has to fail. Um, so no, no, nothing. Disre disregard my, my comment. OK. Yeah, it's tricky because it's, um, so you could in principle have a regime where this would work for moderately low uh, frequencies. Um, I mean, it all depends on whether or not you're unlucky to have a resonance with a higher energy state at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look here, the velocity is actually pretty, it's not like super small, right? It's a uh, 10 to the minus one, right? So one tenth. That's, you know, that's actually pretty good. Um, in terms of the differences in this energy scales. But it's definitely not the fastest. Although I think there have been, there is more work recently um, where they discuss this expansion from the low velocity, the low frequency limit, not the, the high frequency limit. Um, but yeah, I haven't actually looked at that paper in any detail. All right, thank you, Philip. Mm -hmm. Very nice talk, very nice work. Thank you. All right. Okay, so thank you, everyone. We are going to have a speaker next week. We are going to announce in your website. So keep watching us that there will be news. Thank you, Phil, again. Mm -hmm. See you all next time. Thank you. <laughs>